Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Page and the Reluctant Artist by Darcy Garcia, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter One. Paige Liston leaned against the black rental SUV, staring down at the broken heel of her Christian Louboutin shoe. Raising her head slightly, she scanned the desolate road behind her, even the spectacular backdrop of rugged mountains, their jagged peaks reaching majestically towards a cloudless sky, failed to pull her from her wretched mood. With a sigh of frustration, she swiped a stray piece of blonde hair from her forehead before tucking it impatiently behind her ear. She had been driving the stretch of dirt road for 40 minutes and had not yet seen another vehicle. Exhausted, Paige had thought to take a quick break to stretch her long legs. Instead, she had twisted her ankle, stepping out of her vehicle. Mentally reprimanding people who insisted on living in the middle of nowhere, she climbed back into the SUV, taking off her other shoe first and throwing it into the passenger seat. Paige again checked her phone and sighed when it showed there were still no bars. I have to be close, she muttered. Before she had lost signal, the GPS showed she had been within several miles of the Montana ranch that belonged to Mark Richards. Reaching into her makeup case, she pulled out a pale pink lipstick. Adjusting the rearview mirror, she applied it carefully, noting that her pale violet eyes were slightly bloodshot from the long plane ride. Smiling quickly to be sure none made it onto her perfect white, perfect white teeth, She placed the lipstick back in the bag. You can do this, she stated firmly as she pulled back onto the road. Just go in there, promise him the world, and he's yours. Turning up the stereo, Paige tried to calm her nerves. This was always the hardest part. Convincing an artist to sign with a gallery could be extraordinarily difficult, but signing on an unknown could be close to impossible. Mark Richards' art piece had surfaced several months ago while she had been attending a small gathering in Brooklyn. It was unusual for her to stray outside of Manhattan, although she had spent most of her childhood in the Bronx. Relentless, her friend Camilla had finally convinced her to go. It was there that Paige had first observed Mark Richards' work. She had almost missed it completely. Placed on a small table in the entryway, it rested casually against dove-colored walls. It was simple yet arresting. The subject matter would have normally been underwhelming, a horse standing at the edge of a paddock, the backdrop of beautiful vista comprised of mountains and wildflowers. Yet this artist had done something remarkable. He had managed painting outwards, freeing the subject from the canvas. The colors, while mostly muted, drew the eye, pinning the observer's attention. The artist clearly wanted this stallion noticed above all else, and he succeeded. Entirely silver, except for a small patch of white that only covered a quarter of his mane, he stood proudly, head raised so that you could see the corded muscles stretched beneath the sleek coat. His intense gaze was focused on something known only in the artist's imagination. Paige could almost feel the breeze that swayed the myriad wildflowers. The sky was slightly cloudy, yet the creation of shafts of sunlight saved it from being gloomy. Paige could almost hear the horse's breath blowing out softly through its gently flared nostrils, a sweet nickering of welcome. There was so much detail that she had picked up the canvas, the better to study it. She wanted to crawl inside and run her fingers down the stallion's thick neck. But what really took her breath away, elicited goosebumps, made her heart beat faster were the stallion's eyes. When she searched them, something inside her hurt. For in their depths, she could see the suffering he had endured. Paige ran her fingers over the canvas as though to comfort him, pausing while she tried to compose herself. It was signed, Mark Richards. She had never heard of him, but nonetheless was determined that she would find him. It had taken Camilla coming to physically pull her out of the entryway for Paige to put the canvas down. What are you doing? She asked, her brows furrowed in annoyance. You've been standing here for ten minutes. It's my job, Camilla, she answered, still distracted by the canvas. Observing her friend's irritation, she sighed loudly. Fine, she conceded reluctantly, placing the treasure back where she had found it. But you do remember I'm an art curator, right? In fact, Paige Liston was one of the very best and in high demand among the New York gallery elites. 
Page did not just love art. She absorbed it, breathing it in like oxygen. Her mother had shared once that her father, who had died when Page was just two, had loved to paint, often working from used canvases thrown in the trash because they couldn't afford new ones. He had never believed that his art was anything special. One day, her mother had given her the only painting she had kept, the rest discarded years before. Paige had wept when she held the small canvas, her tears rolling off onto the only tangible item she had from him. She remembered thinking how extraordinary, how brilliant his creation was as she held it in her trembling hands. He had died penniless, his greatest talent relegated to a dusty attic. At just 26, a graduate of Pratt University, she was one of the youngest ever to have worked with the esteemed Paul Roja of Roja Galleries. Paige knew she came from the wrong side of the tracks. The Bronx did not mesh with the Manhattanites, and Paige had always felt the sting of their rejection. Roja Galleries catered to a very elite artists, those with a tremendous following, but two sought those who had yet to be discovered. The rich and famous that she had once felt would be forever elusive now called her for help in procuring precious art from all over the world. Paul was now in his 60s, and Paige thought of him as a fa father. It had been just her and her mother, Leanne, until she too had passed away two years ago unexpectedly. It had taken Paige months to feel whole again, and Paul had been with her every step of the way, even bringing her favorite Thai food from the small restaurant around the corner from her uptown apartment. She had settled down a very long way from the poor neighborhood she had grown up in. Her mother had struggled to keep a roof over their heads, and Paige had hated to see her so exhausted. She remained determined that her parents' fate would not be her own. That another brilliant artist would never fall between the cracks because they were poor. Working hard, it allowed her the life she thought she wanted, living in the classiest neighborhood, wearing the best designer clothing. She had carefully molded herself into someone that mattered. Well, it's not your painting, and this is a party, Camilla stated, forcing Paige back from her thoughts. Can we please just mingle and have fun? Feeling guilty, she nodded, glancing over her shoulder longingly one more time before finally following her friend, who was already one cocktail ahead. That night, Paige had convinced the owner, the painter's aunt, to allow her to have Paul look at the piece. As she suspected, he thought it was extraordinary reaching out himself to Mr. Richards. It was after this conversation when Paul shared with Paige Mark's reluctance to share any of his work. Rohau Gallery was known throughout the world. Artists represented in their Manhattan location were the very best, and should your work be selected, you consider yourself as having arrived, not only as an artist, but in New York's high society as well. Mr. Richards, however, did not live in New York. He lived in Helena, Montana. Where? Paige asked, her face reflecting the horror at the prospect, as Paul advised her where she would need to travel to meet the unwilling artist. It not that just mountains minus civilization? She complained, appalled at the idea. Paige loved New York. The city was alive and vibrant, full of culture and romance and clothes and restaurants. It was an extraordinary mecca of diversions. Paul, seriously, do I really need to go all the way to, where? where is it again? Montana? Helena, he replied dryly, unimpressed with Paige's theatrics. Yes, you need to go. And you will go. Paige was so preoccupied with her misery that she almost missed the small wooden sign that announced the entrance to Carmel Ranch. Oh, thank Louis Vuitton, she muttered, relieved to finally have finally reached her destination. Stopping briefly on the dirt road leading to the ranch, she pulled, put the SUV into park and reaching back, grabbed her Chanel duffel bag. Inside was a spare pair of shoes. See, she thought, mentally applauding her foresight. People think you're crazy for carrying spare shoes, but who's crazy now? Taking them out, she quickly put them on, placing her other pair in the bag. She held the broken one against her chest for a few moments, mourning its loss before placing it in the bag as well. Taking a deep breath, she continued down the dirt narrow dirt road. For the first thousand feet, there were giant quaking aspens, enormous oxygen factories that stretched close to 80 feet. At their peak, they bowed to each other, kissing lightly. 
Lining both sides of the gravel drive, their canopy allowed the sun to rain effervescent droplets, enveloping Paige with the warmth of their welcome. Slowly, she opened her window, breathing in the earthy scents, its pet petrichor unfamiliar to her senses. Immediately, she felt herself relax. As inhaling deeply, she continued slowly on. Paige found herself strangely unwilling to leave the comfort of the sheltering haven. However, her breath caught at the spectacular vista awaiting. Holy amazing mansion, she breathed out as the trees suddenly parted, opening to a wide circular drive. Mark Richards' home sat majestically in the middle of a vast oasis of green. All white, it was very much reminiscent of the Greek revival mansions of the Old South, complete with six large pillars. Paige fell instantly in love with the wide verandas running the full length of the home on both floors. Spectacular floor-to-ceiling windows covered the entire first floor of the home. Enormous blue antique double doors cro crooked their wooden fingers, inviting her in. Overflowing hanging plants hung from above the porch rail, the colors a kaleidoscope encompassing a rainbow spectrum. To the left, beneath a giant cedar tree, rested a double chaise, its plush pillows in exact color matched to the door. The porch itself had several oversized rocking chairs, as well as a hammock with outdoor ceiling fans placed strategically above them all. As Paige pulled into the driveway, she noticed the stable towards the back of the home. A white fence that went too far back for Paige to see from her vantage point surrounded it. In the far distance, she could see horses standing quietly, at least four from what she could tell. She had fully expected that Mark Richards lived a very humble existence, yet this was anything but humble. It was extraordinarily beautiful and modern, considering the location. Paige suddenly felt ashamed for her preconceived judgment. She was so busy looking at the property that she never noticed the man who was standing on the porch, his intense gaze following her as she exited the vehicle. Mark Richards was dreading this visit, once again regretting his decision. Paul Roja had been very convincing. While Mark appreciated his direct approach, it was the fact that Mr. Roja had known of his parents' altruistic endeavors that had ultimately led him to consider his request. Despite Mark insisting he had no intention of selling his artwork, Mr. Roja had promised that if, after his curator's visit, he still felt the same, he would never bother him again. Mark's impression was that, had he not agreed, Mr. Roja might make a pest of himself. He had every intention of making this a brief visit until, that is, he watched the blonde beauty make her way to the front of her truck. Mark felt the attraction like a punch to his gut. Tall, her blonde hair rested just below her waist. From his vantage point on the porch, he could make out full lips and even fuller breasts. Her white blouse was semi-sheer, hinting at the flesh that spilled provocatively from the top of her bra. He almost laughed when he observed her attempt to pull her heel out of the wet earth, a result of the rain that had soaked the ground last night. He wondered if Paul was banking on her beauty to get him to sign and smiled to himself at the thought. Mark was no stranger to the attentions of beautiful women. Beautiful women were everywhere, but a woman with compassion, a, a woman who could see beyond the physical to the heart, still eluded him. He couldn't go anywhere without experiencing, experiencing blatant interest, however. He was unmoved by the adulation, mostly. It didn't hurt that he was extremely wealthy, having inherited his trust fund at age 23. His parents had perished in a plane crash on their way back from Africa. They were fervent animal rights activists trying to stop the senseless murders of elephants for their tusks. Mark had been just 15, and he still missed them both like it was yesterday. With no other living relatives, it was his maternal aunt who had stepped in and given Mark all the love that he, all the love she could. It had been in her home that Miss Liston had noticed his painting. After graduating from college with a degree in business, he had picked up where his parents had left off. But for Mark, his passion for saving animals had led him to horses. He had been on a trip to Montana visiting his college friend Steve Carter when he was first introduced to their plight. After Steve had picked him up from the airport, they had headed out on a long drive to his friend's home. He had been astonished by the wide open spaces, the backdrop of a rugged majestic landscape, its mountains proud and commanding. What had sealed, really sealed the deal, however, was the vast areas of verdant space. Mark loved New York, but the only green space was in Central Park, which he felt was always too crowded. He had never known how much, however, until his visit to this stunning oasis. Mark observed the ample pasture land, remarking on the cattle and horses roaming freely. 
It was then that Steve had shared with him his sadness over the fate of old horses. He himself had saved several, however, his finances were not such that he could handle more than that. In fact, he planned on heading to the auction house where many of his, these poor creatures were being sold off. His passion for saving animals on high alert, Mark had joined him. That was the day Mark was introduced to Stormcloud. A stallion, his previous owner, had used him for, first for racing, then for stud. Now he no longer served any purpose, so he was being discarded. Mark felt his rage rise that any animal should be treated with so little regard. The two had approached the small makeshift corral, and Mar Mark had instantly been drawn to the stallion. He seemed to keep away from the other horses, standing proudly, an island unto himself. Mark made his way to where the animal stood. Just as he was about to reach out to touch him, he heard a voice behind him. I wouldn't do that if I were you, the stranger remarked. Storm clouds as mean as they come. I should know, been on the receiving end of his teeth and hooves a few times. Can't wait to get rid of him. Turning, Mark observed an older gentleman, maybe in his late sixties. He wore denim coveralls, his face weathered. He held his cowboy hat, tapping it on his leg as he looked over at his horse, not attempting to hide his dislike. Without responding, Mark turned back, slowly reaching out his hand, running it gently down his flank. With a loud snort, the horse swung his head, looking directly into Mark's eyes. He knew that this proud beast was assessing him, so Mark held his gaze, his own eyes reflecting only compassion. In that moment, he felt an instant connection, so visceral he could barely conceal the wave of emotion that threatened to overwhelm him as he swallowed convulsively to mask the strength of his response. Well, boy, he said, looks like it's you and me from now on. He had purchased Stormcloud that day, despite not yet having any way to care for him. Steve had kept him at his stable, and within two weeks, Mark had purchased his own property. Since then, six other horses had joined Stormcloud, the most recent purchased on his 30th birthday. Mark remained determined to save as many as he could.